I suddenly lost my Wi-Fi with five minutes to go. So uh, apologies, we're a little bit late starting um, tonight. Um, so welcome to the next in our series of Bleeding Lives Matters. And um, tonight I'm very pleased to welcome John Hanley and William Horsley, who will be talking you through the uh, clinical reference group, which is a specialised blood disorders clinical reference group, and what it's all about, who's involved in it, and how it can impact on people's lives. So, um, very welcome to you both, and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to do this for us. We do appreciate it. A couple of um, just housekeeping things first. Most of you see you're on mute when you join. If you can keep it on mute just to keep down the background noise, that would be appreciated. Uh, we will be recording this session and it will be available on our website um, next week at some point. And that will just be for the slides and for the speaker view only. So um, there is chance to ask questions. If you go to the bottom, you'll see the chat function you can ask questions through there and at the end of the session I will put any questions to um, our lovely presenters. Um, so that's all, I shall now hand over to John Hanley who's the um, Chair of the CRG. Um, thanks very much John, over to you. We just need to unmute, hang on. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks very much. Um, for that introduction. And uh, I've got some slides which I'm going to uh, share in a minute. Uh, but just to say at the outset, um, I'm this is a double act, myself and Will Horsley, and I'll, I'll explain who we are. And um, I hope the presentation is of interest and very happy to be interrupted if, if uh, that's possible on Zoom or um, answer any questions at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to open the presentation now and share my screen. Hopefully. Okay. Okay. So I hope uh, you can see see my screen now. Getting a few nods, so that's good. So um, just to introduce myself properly, so I'm a consultant haematologist in Newcastle, where I'm speaking from now, um, and I'm co-director of the Newcastle Haemophilia Comprehensive Care Centre. And I've been chair of the Specialised Blood Disorders uh, CRG for... I, I can't remember exactly how long, maybe nearly two years now, something like that. Thanks, Will. Um, and, but before that, I was a member of the, the CRG, I think more or less since it started, which is uh, probably about seven or eight, nine years ago, that kind of thing. So it's been going for quite a few years. And my co-presenter, Will Horsley, he is a pharmacist by background, and he's also based in the Northeast. Um, and he's the lead commissioner for haemophilia. And uh, it, may, it may be that uh, some of you will want to ask him a bit more about that role and how he ended up as the lead commissioner. But he's, um, he also happens to be our local commissioner in the Northeast. So I've known Will for many years. And um, it's been great fun working with him on the CRG. And in a relatively short period of time, I think we've um, managed to do quite a few good things. So, um, why do, we, why do we have these CRGs and where, where do they fit into the NHS? And um, I'll I tell you what, I just need to move. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so um, the, the reason we have CRGs uh, is really to provide a forum for discussion about uh, how to deliver high quality services for certain aspects of uh, treatment for patients in the NHS and um, the the CRG model is is particularly appropriate to uh, services within the NHS which are um, badged as being specialized so haemophilia is an example of that and we'll I'll go into talk about that a bit more and um, not only is it a, a, a discussion group but it's also uh, a group that is meant to provide expert advice 
to NHS England and other stakeholders in the NHS about their specific area of expertise in in this case um, haemophilia and other bleeding disorders so um, the the CRG brings together uh, people who bring to the table um, a, a, a certain knowledge and expertise in a particular area and um, the, the the focus is about using that information to develop strategies within the NHS to develop high quality services for patients. So that it's a very uh, kind of patient focused um, discussion. John. And, oh, yeah, sorry. sorry, it's Will. It's Will. Hello, everyone. Um, I mean, what I was just going to add there is if you go back quite a few years and think about the changes that brought in uh, NHS England, the whole specialised commission divide, the overriding vision there was for a clinically led NHS and in primary care you got clinical commissioning groups and in for the acute sector for the specialized commissioning you've got a whole bunch of managers and accountants running that side of it but we are advised by 45 clinical reference groups um, with clinical chairs in charge that's that was the, the the original prompt for the whole thing back to you John yeah thanks Will that that was really helpful to you know put it in its kind of wider context. So, um, uh, and I'll, I'll expand a little bit on that. But on on this slide, uh, some of the key activities of the CRG um, are are kind of mentioned. So, and I'll, I'll try to relate these to some of the things we've done in relation to haemophilia. So, if um, if you take the example of clinical commissioning policies, well, what what does that mean? Well Specialised services within the NHS are provided by trusts. If you take Newcastle as an example, we provide the Haemophilia Comprehensive Care Centre for this region, and we are commissioned to do that by our local commissioners. So resources come from the commissioners into the trust in order to give us the infrastructure to provide the service. And the way we do it is often informed by clinical commissioning policy. So if there's an area of um, treatment or um, an approach to care, it can be described in the clinical commissioning policy developed by the relative experts on the CRG and then it's submitted and approved and then that becomes part of what uh, is expected to be commissioned as part of a specialised service. An another aspect of that is the service specification. So there's a a, um, a detailed service specification uh, laid out which describes all the elements of service for haemophilia care and again that's used to uh, encourage uh, providers in NHS Trust to uh, be providing the right type of uh, service and be held to account to a certain extent by the local commissioners and then once the service is being delivered, well, how do you uh, monitor whether or not it's any good? Well, one of the ways you can do that is by um, using quality dashboards. So having certain standards that the providers of the service then have to uh, provide evidence that they're actually meeting the standard. And um, one of the jobs of the CRG is to, is to come up with clinically useful ways of measuring quality which can then be used to assess whether or not a high quality service is actually being, um, being delivered. Another really important aspect of it is to uh, think ahead. So what's coming around the corner uh, for people with bleeding disorders in terms of innovation and new treatment? And um, I don't need to tell this audience about all the um, amazing and exciting new treatments that are around for haemophilia and other bleeding disorders, um, the development of hemisuzumab, hemolibra, a lot of patients are now on, is a good example. And the CRG and Will in particular was absolutely instrumental in uh, getting NHS England approval for very rapid access to hemisuzumab uh, in, in England. And uh, I should say that the CRG functions in, in England. It's an NHS England um, group. Uh, but what often happens is that uh, policies devised in England are then automatically more or less adopted by 
uh, Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. So that, that often happens. And then another, another example is, is gene therapy. So gene therapy is producing amazing uh, results in clinical trials for uh, both haemophilia A and haemophilia B. So gene therapy products aren't that far off potentially being licensed. So how is that going to be commissioned and delivered within the NHS to make sure that patients who want to go down the gene therapy route have access to that treatment in a fair and equitable way? So it's about coming up with, um, with advice to work towards um, not only um, equitable and fair, but also cost-effective treatment. Because in the NHS, that's always a big issue. You know, are we using whatever treatments available in the most cost-effective way? And, and we know, uh, you know, from the doctor perspective, from the commissioner perspective, from the patient perspective, the best way to do that is through a collaborative discussion. Uh, and that, that brings, uh, brings uh, me nicely on to the next point. Um, a very, very important part of the uh, makeup of the CRG is the so-called so PPV members, that's patient and public voice. So these members of the CRG who are often patients um, who have the uh, relevant condition and they can bring their patient voice and patient experience to the table <clears throat> and uh, the patient groups like the Hemophilia Society. So, and then within the structure of NHS England, each CRG sits within a so-called so national program of care. So um, our CRG sits within the Blood and Infectious Diseases Program of Care Board. So this is really the next level up. So if I have a problem and um, I'm not sure how to take it forward, I go to the, the person who runs the, the program of care board for advice. And certainly over the last couple of years, that's happened on several occasions, and I've always found that very responsive. And then the, the program of care board itself, uh, as, as the chair of the blood disorder CRG, I go to those meetings or some of those meetings, and I have the opportunity to present the issues that my CRG is grappling with and uh, then get support from other people, other CRGs sometimes. Sometimes there's, there's issues that, that cut across different CRGs. Um, so uh, in this particular program care board, we often have uh, collaborative discussions between CRGs as well. Now for some reason, Whilst you're um, faffing around in the next slide, John, um, yeah. the, t the top there, you've got the clinical commissioning policies. That's one of our big successes in our CRG. We've had a steady stream of policies going through and we've not had any fail yet. They've all got through. They may not have got through at the first pass. And there might have been a bit of haggling going on behind the scenes, but we've got them all through. And um, there's a policy which is currently being considered the Vonicog Alpha policy. And um, I can't reveal the outcome of that, but if you could see... I don't know if people can see me now and I'm smiling. You might guess um, what the outcome is and hopefully there'll be an announcement in the next few days on that one. So that means, you know, 100% success rate so far on all our policies. I'm really pleased about that. And that's down to the hard work of CRG members and other people that we draft in to help us. Uh, that was very effective use, use of non-verbal communication. I'm very impressed with that. Good. Um, all right, sorry, I've, I've managed to move on to the next slide. So um, to give you a bit of an idea, the, there are six programs of care and there are, there are about um, between 40 and 50 CRGs. So um, you can imagine in, in the NHS, um, a, uh, a condition like haemophilia is relatively small numbers of patients and uh, relatively specialised. And um, in, in every discipline of, of of, uh, in hospitals, there are these very specialized areas like in, in hematology, for instance, bone marrow transplantation or the care of sickle cell and hemoglobinopathy, they have their own CRGs. Uh, there's a CRG for hepatitis C, there's um, an HIV uh, CRG, and uh, away from um, uh, hematology and infectious diseases, there's a CRG for specialised areas of rheumatology, some types of surgery, and so on. 
So all the different areas of expertise. And, and, but to have a CRG, you need to be considered a specialised service. So there, there isn't a CRG for common things because they're commissioned in the NHS in a slightly different way. And, um, you know, the, 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 the mechanism for developing policies in those areas and making sure the quality is good and all the rest of it is slightly different. So, and our, the name of our CRG, CRG is interesting. It's always had this name, Specialised Blood Disorders, um, but it really is bleeding disorders. And there's a rare um, blood disorder called TTP, which is also under the wing of CRG. Um, but it's always, so in other words, uh, haemophilia and, and blood disorder and bleeding disorders have always had their own CRG. And I, th I think it's really important that, um, that well, it, it's a recognition in the first place that, that it is important. Because over the years, some CRGs have been merged together and that kind of thing. So, you know, the, the danger with merging with another CRG is that your voice gets slightly diluted. So I think it, it's really good that we've always, very easily, to be honest, maintained um, our um, blood disorder, bleeding disorder, haemophilia specific CRG, because that has massive advantages in terms of the channels of communication that you have. Um, and the, the other thing is, as Will mentioned, um, I mean, the, the previous chair of the CRG was um, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jerry Dolan, who I used to work with in Nottingham many years ago, and he's now working at St. Thomas's. And he chaired the CRG for a number of years. And uh, I think um, in the time that the CRG has, has um, uh, existed, it's been a very effective grouping and it's always been viewed as well organized and active. And part of the reason for that is it's uh, you know, a very excellent membership. And on the next slide, I'll come back to that. And um, the, I mentioned value for money, um, but the, the CRG, and it's not just the CRG because the CRG links in with the UK HCDO, the Haemophilia Nurses Association and other professional groups, but also Within um, the NHS, there's another very important uh, group called the Commercial Medicines Unit, which coordinates uh, negotiations with um, pharma companies in relation to access to uh, treatments and the cost of them to the NHS. And um, improving value schemes um, are a very important part of that to, to make sure that, um, you know, not only is the clinical quality good, but uh, there's uh, value for money and um, best use of resources, which is always an issue within the NHS. And everyone needs to kind of acknowledge that to a certain extent. The, the, the other thing is, um, we've also had a very um, consistent membership. So uh, in the years I've been involved, um, you know, there have been changes of role but there have been some people who've been involved in it right from the beginning. So you have that kind of memory of, you know, what's gone before and the lessons learned previously, as well as new, new people coming in. And uh, when the CRG was, um, was um, open to new applications, it was great um, over the last kind of 12 or 18 months to have new faces on the CRG because it's, it's important to keep, uh, you know, refreshing things. So that, that brings me to um, a list of who's involved. So this kind of gives you, gives you an idea of who's around the table and uh, perhaps why the CRG has been so you know, successful because we've got some really uh, talented members. Uh, so Will is our lead com commissioner. I do my best to chair it. Um, and uh, then the, the first people to really mention are, are two very key individuals. So Matt, Matt Gregory, is a, a patient with haemophilia who has been involved as um, a patient representative on the group for some time now. On so many occasions, Matt has um, you know, told us you know, certain things that from a patient's perspective, we wouldn't necessarily have considered. And you know, his, his voice has been very important. Now, N Nicholas Sugg, who many of you will know from the Haemophilia Society, uh, she has um, been a member for a while 
And before Nicola, Liz Carroll was uh, involved in CRG for many years. Um, and Liz made a massive uh, contribution. And um, I know she uh, moved on from the Human Philly Society recently, but I would really like to um, take the opportunity to acknowledge her and Liz's Definitely. absolutely fantastic contribution. And then uh, the next, next bunch are all clinicians. So uh, some of you may know some of these characters. Uh, John Passy is um, based at the Royal London uh, Hospital and he is one of the national and international experts in gene therapy. He's been a pioneer of gene therapy. So he is massively knowledgeable and experienced and very valuable member of the CRG. Charlie Hay, who you may know, um, again, he's a very experienced hemophilia doctor based in Manchester. He's previously um, set up the uh, National Hemophilia Database and uh, has been instrumental in the way that that's functioned over the years. He's a very wise head and um, um, a very uh, useful member of the CRG. Tina Dutt from Liverpool, uh, Sarah Mangles from Basingstoke, Susie Shapiro from Oxford, Emily Simonton from Cambridge, Charles Perry from Birmingham. So uh, that bunch, they're, they're all youngsters. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're younger consultants. They're all involved with haemophilic care. Tina is a TTP expert, another condition that we have to sort out through the C CRG. So they're a fantastic bunch. They're, they're the future of haemophilia care in the UK. They're going to be running the show in a, in a few years. And, you know, they've already cut their teeth in sorting out quite a lot of dif uh, difficult problems. Cathy Harrison from uh, Sheffield, nurse specialist from Sheffield. She's fantastic. Uh, she's um, been a, a, a previous chair of the Haemophilia Nurse, uh, Nursing Association, the HNA. Uh, she's uh, again very experienced and brings a nursing perspective to the group. Uh, Rai Leesner is the current uh, chair of the UK CDO. She's a paediatric hematologist from Great Ormond Street. Again, a very experienced uh, clinician um, with particular expertise in the care of children with bleeding disorders, and uh, as well as being the current chair of the UK CDO. And the, that that link with the UK CDO is very important and I'll come on to uh, come to talk about that a bit more. Anna Wells is a physiotherapist from Basin? Yeah, Basin Stoke, yeah. Basingstoke, yeah. So Anna, what does Sarah Mangle say? Um? Yeah, so she works with Sarah and uh, Anna's been absolutely fantastic. Again, bringing the physio perspective, we all know physiotherapy is an absolutely crucial part of uh, haemophilia care and um, you know that uh, makes sure that the physio voice is, is, is heard loud and clear around the table. And then Giles Ratcliffe, um, he's not a haemophilia doctor but he is a public health consultant so Giles is great in terms of giving a kind of public health overview. Public health doctors are heavily involved in commissioning processes so he often gives us very kind of wise advice about how we should uh, you know, take some of our issues, issues forward. So um, this bunch has basically been going for a couple of years and as Will was saying, we've already um, done quite a lot of work, but there's, there's plenty of other projects that we've got ongoing. And we were meeting face to face about three times a year, but we've moved to online meetings like everybody. And uh, to be honest, they work pretty well. Um, we produce reports and take uh, problems to the uh, Programme of Care Board and I attend, the, attend those meetings from time to time. And then in between the meetings, there's all sorts of um, ongoing work uh, that we keep in touch with each other by, by email and so on. And the, the info online uh, thing at the top is a, is a, um, uh, a process, a, a, a facility that we can use to share documents and is, is quite useful IT um, um, facility that has been sorted out for CRGs to help our work. And then ju just to um, say something more about the PPV, so um, we, we, we used to have um, three PPV voices but 
Um, for some reason, NHS England decided to reduce that to two. Um, and th th I suppose you could say, well, that's not necessarily good. But um, I think it is true to say that if you have high quality uh, PPV reps, they're absolutely wait worth their weight in gold, you know, in terms of, you know, helping the CRG understand, you know, important issues. And, um, you know, everyone involved in either the delivery or receiving care has got a slightly different perspective. And, um, you know, sometimes the clinicians involved might put a different emphasis on things or different prioritization. But given that, you know, we're meant to be providing the service for the patients, uh, it's very important that the patient perspective and the patient's priorities are actually the, the ones that are often given priority. Um, and well, that, that issue about, um, you know, being a, a voice in terms of representing the patient group and not just, you know, necessarily reflecting their own experience. I mean, certainly the uh, PPV members over the years, I've never had the feeling that they have just, you know, been talking about their own narrow experience. They often refer to uh, conversations that they've had with other patients, uh, chat rooms that they're involved with, where they gather, um, you know, the collective view about a particular issue and then feed that into the CRG. And, and also, you know, challenge is a very important part of that. And uh, um, all the PPV uh, members, including the current members, have, have, you know, are very challenging when, when appropriate, always in a nice way. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it can be a bit intimidating with, you know, a bunch of experienced um, haemophilia clinicians around the table. And, you know, sometimes somebody might, you know, say something that is, uh, that requires challenge or at least clarification. So the PP, PPV reps are very important in that role, as well as, you know, championing and advocating um, increasing, you know, patient and public awareness and so on. Uh, and then the critical review of documentation is very important because often, you know, you, you write stuff and you think it's un understandable, but in actual fact, it's a bit too jargony or it's used, you know, kind of medical terms that people aren't necessarily familiar with. And, uh, you know, writing stuff that is actually understandable is, is obviously very important. Um, the, the next few slides, just to finish off very quickly, is just, just a, an example of, of one of the things that the CRG is currently grappling with. So, I'd, um, I'd be interested to uh, hear from people on the line after after this because it, it, you may have been involved in the peer review program that's been uh, going on over the last couple of years. So, um, just uh, to for those of you who aren't familiar with what's been going on, uh, basically the UK CDO has coordinated the, the peer review program over the last couple of years, and. Um, we linked up with a, a, a peer review organization, which was, uh, is based in Birmingham and started off working particularly in the West Midlands. So they, uh, when we first hooked up with them, they were called the West Midlands Quality Review Service. And we basically put our heads together with various stakeholders, including the Hemophilia Society, and drew up this document, which is the quality standards for the care of people with inherited and acquired hemophilia and other bleeding disorders. And if you click on that link, you can see the standards. So it's just a whole load of standards, you know, what a good service would look like if you meet all these standards. And then um, over a period of just over a year, all the, um, all the uh, comprehensive care centres and some of the bigger hemophilia centres in the UK were visited by peer review teams. And some people on the line may have been involved in some of those visits. And it, in, over that period of time, the uh, West Midlands Quality Review Service renamed itself the Quality Review Service. So they, they dropped the West Midlands bit. And that is really to reflect that they essentially become a national organisation and they run and coordinate peer review programmes in all sorts of different areas. It's, it's what they do and what their expertise is. And if you look at their website, you can, you can see all the different amazing work they do. And uh, every uh, comprehensive care centre and haemophilia centre that went through the peer review process 
there's now on the website a um, a, uh, a report. So I, I, I think there were 37 visits, so there are 37 reports on the website. And that goes into a lot of detail in relation to individual centres. So if you want to see the peer review report, the centre that you attend, you can go on that website and read it. And um, in, the, but a lot of the reports are fairly similar in the sense that they usually say there are, there's a lot of very high quality care going on around the place, but everywhere has got some issues. And uh, the way the peer review process uh, works, it basically you have to provide evidence and then convince the inspectors that you are uh, meeting a particular standard. And then you either meet it or you don't. And if they think that you haven't met it, then that's mentioned in the report as something that you need to sort out. So um, things like if you haven't got adequate facilities or you haven't got enough staff, or you're not meeting a standard in relation to linking in with a key specialty. You know, there's all sorts of things. And if you take staffing as an example, so if you look at the 37 centres and then look at the key aspects of staffing, um, a surprising number of places were judged inadequate in relation to certain types of staff, particularly physiotherapy, psychology, and social work, um, and nursing to a certain extent. Now, I, just to reassure the patients, uh, if you look at the individual reports, uh, it often says things like, this particular haemophilia centre or comprehensive care centre has got a fantastic bunch of staff and they're providing very high quality service, but frankly, they're a bit frazzled and they're only doing it, because, doing it so well because they're so committed and the patients are getting a high quality service, but they act, to make it sustainable and even better, they need additional resources. So uh, the way this has gone, is, there's the exact stage we're at at the moment, and this is where the CRG comes in. So this, this peer review process is owned by the UK HCBO, so the UK HCBO are running. The final report, this thing, um, gives an overview, a national overview, and this isn't just England, this is the whole of the UK. Um, and um, the UK HCDO is going to uh, liaise with all the haemophilia centres, comprehensive care centres, to get feedback about how the, um, the issues raised by the peer review uh, are being addressed. And that how they're addressed is up to the local team and their local commissioners to look at things and, you know, sort whatever problems out and then in another 12 months 18 months we'll go back to those places this is the UK HCDO and you know ask for an update now where the CRG comes into this is that we can um, assist this process by coming up with some um, some uh, metrics which can help um, kind of link into the peer review standards. And this is an area of work we're grappling with at the moment. So uh, for instance, um, you know, what, why are there differences in staffing levels between different places? And what would you regard as the minimum staffing requirement for a haemophilia center or comprehensive care center of a certain size? So the CRG can, can you know, say something about that. So it's an example of collaborative working. So what the CRG is interested in is the same thing as what the Haemophilia Society is interested in. Same thing as the UK CDO and the HNA and the physio group and the social work group. Everyone is interested in providing high quality, cost effective, excellent care for everyone. Uh, and uh, you know, each group has a slightly different role in terms of you know, prodding that process and moving it on. Um, and a lot of the um, a lot of the work cuts across between the CRG and the UK HCDO and other NHS bodies and patient groups. Uh, but the, the key thing about the CRG is it's the only forum where all those stakeholders come together and can make the contribution that they can make. So I, I've slightly lost track of the time, so I'm not sure if. Um, the um, hang on, I'm going to unshare now. Yeah. 
Um, I, I, I think I'll just stop there. Will might have some, uh, some things he just wants to add in uh, and then be very happy to take, take questions however, however you want to do that. Will, do you want to um, add something at the end of that one? Oh, you're yes, can you hear me? I was just um, tapping yes. away on the chat, and I was think I was trying to answer Lawrence's first question in the chat, but I, That's I didn't. That's fine. We, yeah, we, can add, we, can ask, we can ask them verbally, so don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, I think I just want to go back to uh, the last couple of slides on the CRG. Um, so we're very lucky that the CRG has never been changed. We've always had a specialised blood disorder CRG, and there have been significant revisions to CRGs over time. Particularly a few years ago, there was quite a cull. There was there were originally about 75 CRGs, and there's now 45. Um, and as part of that, the CRG memberships were trimmed as well. So every CRG had, had its membership trimmed. Um, and so every CRG went from three to two PPV reps. Um, and that was mainly to help a lot of CRGs that were struggling to get any PPV reps at all. We've never had that problem. So it was a bit of a shame that we got caught up in that, but so be it, as I say, we've got two very good reps. Um, I put an asterisk next to Nicola's name simply because, although officially it's Nicola Sugg, who's the um, uh, sort of Haemophilia Society rep there, really that position is there for the Haemophilia Society to put in whoever they want. And, and it was previously Liz Carroll who always attended those meetings. And um, Deborah, you attended the last one. Um, yeah. uh, and Nicola has attended one or two as well. So really, really that place for, for the um, Haemophilia Society. Um, but yes, and we've always had, uh, so we've had very consistent membership um, and we've always had, we've always had a relationship with the Blood and Infection Programme Care Board that hasn't changed either as it has for other CRGs. So we've got a really good relationship with the Blood and Infection Programme Care Board. We're definitely seen as one of the higher performing um, uh, CRGs. We do very well. We have contributed substantially to the improving value um, uh, agenda over the last few years. That's basically not exclusively, but mainly about saving money. And the recent frameworks which the CMU has done have delivered uh, multi million pound savings to uh, the NHS. And I know Lawrence has got a question in there about that, so I will uh, respond to that afterwards. Um, and uh, and so far we've been able to make every treatment, every new drug that's available in the existing categories available. We've done, done that through the frameworks and the tenders, as well as getting the policies on board for the new treatment. So we are we are doing well. Yes, we can do better. We are trying to. We want to update the service back a bit. We are looking at revisions to the way in which haemophilia services are funded, uh, simply because that money doesn't always get through to the services and it doesn't always correctly incentivize the services to do to do the sort of preventive stuff that we that, that they want to do. Um, but I have to say, there's there's a lot of work uh, on the on the long list there for NHS England, and we're we're not near the top of that list at the moment. So, um, but I'm keeping it on the agenda. So that's what I wanted to add. Okay, that's great. Actually, while we're on that subject, I think it might be a good idea to perhaps jump in on the um, cost saving and the question that yeah. Lawrence yeah. asked, because it's sort of on yeah, the go on. Then. Shall so I do that, it verbally? Yeah. Yeah. So, how does the UK community protect the cost savings? Because I know, as you said, you work very hard to make some cost savings okay. uh, from the national tender and make sure that goes back into the clinical care practice physios rather than okay. it just getting sucked off into another area. Because I know that's something that people have concerns about. Okay, but within the NHS, there isn't a budget for haemophilia. There's a budget for specialised commissioning. Within that, there are some, a few specific budgets, but not many. It's generally all specialised commissioning within that. And people will, and certain clinical areas will make bigger demands on that budget than others at different times. And those, um, overall, the budget is, is growing. The overall spend in specialised commissioning is is the highest area of spend within the NHS. It's the highest growing area of spend within the NHS. And drugs is a huge part of that, but it's not, it's not all about drugs, but you know, drugs is, is a huge part of it. Um, but there's, there's not a ring fence budget. So if we're making, if we do make savings within the haemophilia field, that money's not lost to the NHS, it's just spent, else, spent elsewhere in the NHS. Um, now the mo most recent framework does potentially offer some incentives to the providers to make those savings and therefore go to the, uh, local commissioners and say, if we save all this money for you by um, maybe using these drugs more cost effectively, could you give us some of that money to invest in our services? And that's a message which I, myself and John, have been promoting recently. And that's something that's just come in with a new framework and um, a, um, 
some changes to the way that contracting happens. I expect, though, when we get the gene therapies online in the next couple of years, uh, the haemophilia bl blood disorders field will be wanting to make a, make a bit more of a draw on those resources, and it will be other areas that will have to cut back. So I know it, I know it looks like um, you know, we had this money being spent on specialised blood disorders, haemophilia, and now we're spending only this much, which is less. Why can't we have that for physios, for nurses, for outreach, for psychologists, for care workers, etc.? But, you know, that money belongs to the NHS as a whole, not just within that, that field. Um, and everyone will have different draws on the overall NHS budget at different times. As I say, I think we are going to be asking for some big additional investments soon when it comes to gene therapies. Um, so hopefully, you know, that's available. I'm sure it will be. We've got a great record so far with um, getting treatments uh, commissioned quite quite quickly. We did a really good draw at MSISMAB. What, well, Lawrence, what's the next question? I haven't seen that. Um, well, we, we can go, we can have, you have mentioned gene therapy. So we'll, we'll talk about that one, but then we'll go back to some of the other earlier ones as well. So, um, the question was about the gene therapy expect to be licensed later this year. Um, I'm not sure if you can answer this. What is the likelihood of reimbursement in the UK? Um, okay, so the funding model, basically. Uh, I, I, mm, likelihood. Let me give you a bit of commentary, and I'll see if I can give you. Um, you see if you can pin me down for a likelihood. Uh, it will be looked at by Nice. There'll be a lot of pressure, I think, because it's going to be one of the first big gene therapies. There are already two or three licensed in the UK, but for the really niche things, I'm talking like a dozen patients or something like that. Um, and John said earlier that haemophilia is not uh, very big specialised. Actually, haemophilia and blood disorders is actually quite a big specialised service. Um, we've got a, um, a few thousand people with severe uh, blood disorder that comes within our remit in, in, in the UK, in England, sorry. So that's, that's quite big actually in the world of specialised commissioning. And the potential uh, applicability for even, even haemophilia B gene therapy, uh, and certainly for haemophilia A gene therapy, will be quite large. So it's going to be, it's going to be quite, uh, it's going to be a bit of a hot potato, I think. There's going to be a lot of um, media interest as well. Um, and I'm sure the Haemophilia Society will be doing quite a bit of work um, to make sure both parties that's pharmaceutical company and the nhs you know make that drug available it is going to come down to cost uh, largely um as these things often do um but i know that nhs england is and nice together are looking at a, lo a few different ideas of how they can fund these things so you've got your traditional pay for the upfront but the problem with that is you don't know if the treatment's going to be success you might infuse the gene into someone gene therapy into someone, and it might not take hold, it might not work, it might have a bad reaction to it, whatever. And that, you know, if you're looking at a million pounds, that's, that's a lot of money, which hasn't been well spent. Um, so maybe you could pay only where it's been successful, or maybe you could pay almost like a mortgage, pay a hundred thousand pounds a year for 10 years, and at the end of the 10 years, um, that's it, mortgage is paid off. Maybe that's the way to do it, but you've got to really get the drug companies on board with that, because they probably want their return quite quickly. Um, there are some other ideas about funding that are being thought about as well. So there's a lot of people who are really trying to, who, who know, who can see these big ticket gene therapies coming along, things like haemophilia, cystic fibrosis as well. Those are the big ticket ones because they're big, potentially big patient populations. And they are trying to already find a way that they are, they can be afforded by the NHS. So you want a likelihood, likelihood, I would say better than 50%. Um, yeah, but don't don't hold me to that. No, no. But I'll be working hard. I'll be uh, me and the CRG be working hard to to get it in. Uh, and there is a, an add-on question to that one, which I probably know the answer to, but I will ask you anyway. Will it made, be made more widely available to mild and moderate people with haemophilia? Uh, I mean, it depends on the price point. It's unlikely to be available to mild people, I suspect, mainly because it won't be um, uh, evidenced and licensed in, in mild disease. Um, the moderates are tricky because there's quite a range, even with the moderate. There's, uh, there are people with moderate, I believe, someone correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, people with moderate who essentially have a severe phenotype, uh, even though they've got, you know, the the trough level in a, in a certain range officially classifies as a moderate. And there's other people at the end of the moderate scale who have got quite a mild phenotype. Um, so we'll have to see how the products are licensed, really. Um, 
I think at most NHS in and would and commissioners and say, well, nice, nice. We'll only look at things in the product license. So I think um, uh, I think at most they would only look at things within the product license. And if the costs are uh, really tough, then there might be some additional criteria put on that to um, ensure that they uh, remain cost effective for the NHS. Okay, great. I, I'm just going to go back to uh, one of the questions that was asked at the beginning, and it was about the service specification. So perhaps we could just offer a bit of clarity about who actually sets these service specifications and what's included in them. Yeah, that service spec was written in about 2011-2012. NHS England came into being in 2013. Uh, NHS England um, ended up producing about 150 service specs in a fairly short space of time. So uh, make from that what you wish. It's it's not a bad service spec, and I know that in some services they've got much bigger issues. Um, but it definitely needs updating and probably tightening up and improving. And it perhaps doesn't reflect, it certainly doesn't reflect um, services in the world of gene therapy. And it probably doesn't really reflect services in the world of hem libra either. But there's a lot of services that need their specs rewriting. And when it's spec gets rewritten it's a lot it's a big job and it has to go to public consultation um, and that team have got a, a long list of service specs uh, which need updating and we're on that list we're not near the top but I'm keeping us on that list and I know I was, I was asked about a year ago do we still need to be there is there still a piece of work when I'm pursuing I said yes I said I appreciate you know I've looked at what else they've got to do and I've got to be perfectly honest you know there are more pressing needs in that respect than than Hemophilia, but um, uh, but I I didn't want it taken off the list, so we're still there. And I said, when you're ready, let us know. And we've got a whole CIG and clinical and patient group here behind us who will help you get this service spec uh, updated. Okay, great. Um, and that may lead on to where we are with you mentioned about um, hemolibur and misuzumab, um, and obviously. Um, there's been a question asked about the trough levels of 10 to 15 percent that can be achieved with something like um is that the one i did i manage to get my answer in on that i don't not? think I you did i think you were typing away it. when i called you in to actually answer that i've so lost it okay that, it's, it's, yeah it's we'll do yeah are going to move beyond the conservative minimum of about one percent trough and move okay. up to something towards 10 less than you know 10 percent ish okay so um we currently uh, sort of piggyback clinical guidelines, which are from, I think, the British Society, you know, the British Committee, BCSH, British Com Committee for Society of Hematology. Anyway, you know yeah. who I mean. Uh, and they reckon, they suggest, they don't, they don't explicitly state, but they suggest a minimum 1%. So that's what we go for as commissioners. Um, I, re I, I do, I'm aware that there's a move to increase that to around about 4 or 5%. And certainly that's where the clinical evidence is kind of moving. Um, the clinical guidelines have not been updated yet to reflect that. Um, when they are, I don't think we can immediately adopt that because there is a potential cost implication now. With some of the uh, prices we got in the last framework, we can probably afford 4 or 5%. But I'm also aware that there are a number of centres and clinicians who are already, already targeting 4 or 5%. Um, some of them have actually told me that. Um, and and actually you can see that in the usage figures that the CMU have so although our total spend in the last since 2016 I think our total spend on blood factor has gone down and that's because the CMU have done a great work uh, with the CRG in tendering for these products for the whole of the UK um, actually number of use, units is going up and up and that's not just because we've got an older population who, who need more. That's not just because we've got um, a slightly, a very small growing population of treated people. It's, it's growing much higher than that as well. And it could only be because patients are having, on average, higher doses. And we've been able to, that hasn't been noticed by anyone really than me within NHS England, um, because simply the, the overall spend is, has dropped by a much higher amount than the total units has gone up so clearly there are a lot of clinicians who are already um, moving towards that kind of mark could, could I come in on that um, so I'm speaking more as a, a haemophilia doctor than chair of CRG so I, I think what Will said is right in the sense that um, I mean in the course of my career uh, the you know the approach to prophylaxis and then 
the uh, the the importance of um, the trough level and then how to administer prophylaxis and then things moved on with the introduction of EHLs and then you know emisuzumab has completely uh, changed everything for haemophilia A and then we've got gene therapy coming down so um, you know to a certain extent um, clinical practice and the evidence base for it uh, and then the the guidelines uh, which you know recommends what you might regard as best practice uh, sometimes get slightly out of sync so I think at, at the moment if you asked um, patients and doctors and nurses who know about these things and physios you know what would be an ideal trough level I, I think what, what most people would say well it, it varies a bit from individual to individual what you really want is a trough level that uh, prevents bleeding you know so and that that seems to vary a bit from patient to patient so it's all about you know, now we've got all loaded different choices in terms of uh, you know what what treatment a particular patient might have at a particular time you know it's a, it, the skill is going to be you know working out in in discussion with with the individual or their parents if they're child you know what the best approach is and it, it's uh, it, it's you know in many ways when when I started um, work as a, a doctor in the haemophilia care it was all fairly easy in the sense that we didn't really have that many <laughs> different treatments and um, you know the it's become more complicated but that that's that's good because it means there are so many different options so I think people are going to start moving away from uh, you know a trough level that is just um, you know kind of used across the board to more individualized care so the, the crucial question for a, a particular patient is how do you prevent bleeding completely and you know in in severe haemophilia moderate and mild you know it's di different challenges but um you know we we all know now that prevention of bleeding is much better than allowing bleeding to happen and then uh, you know treat it when it happens um the more severe your bleeding phenotype um the more uh, treatment you need to prevent bleeding so um, you know I think that's the way it's going to go and the guidelines and then the commissioning of best practice are going to you know have to evolve to keep up with that okay thank you um I think in the interest of time um I know there's a couple of other comments on there and I think you just answered that um John about um preventing irreversible changes in the joints and actually we want to get to the point where people are, are no longer bleeding and I think that's the way that things are moving so I think we've, we've probably just covered all those points um so I just think there's one one more step you talked about um yeah there's um you talked about what the UK HCDO is doing about the, the peer review um and so what is it that the CRG can do in its function to perhaps um, look at best practice, encourage people. What what's the, the plans of the CRG? Yeah, John and I have been talking quite a lot about this recently. Um, one of my plans has been dastardly foiled recently, um, but we are exploring other avenues. We are definitely keeping it high on the agenda with um, the people that matter in NHS England. And I believe it has already been singled out as a priority. There's recently been a cull of priorities within NHS England to make way and make room for um, COVID recovery. And that is, that is, I don't, doesn't matter what else is going on elsewhere in the NHS, COVID recovery is the number one priority um, and getting hospitals and waiting lists back on track, I'm afraid. Um, so we are fighting and swimming against that tide. Um, but we are keeping it high on the agenda. We've got the uh, NHS England Quality, quality surveillance team. That's not the same people that did the review, um, but I recently had a WebEx with them and went through it with them and sent them details. And they are looking at it to, uh, with a view to um, seeing how they can, they're, they're, they're on my side, they're on our side, CRG side, with seeing how they can 
make it a priority for the regions. You've got seven regions within NHS England and each is left to uh, follow up on these sort of things themselves because they, they're the ones who have the local connection with the services they uh, commission. Um, and they're um, under a lot of pressure at the moment with a lot of other things to do. But so we are looking at a way to sell it to them and say, you need to do something about haemophilia, but look, it's not that difficult because these guys have already done all the work for you. They've done, and peer, they've done the peer review. They've told you exactly where the good things are and where the gaps are. All you've got to do is keep on with the providers and make sure they, you know, they're, they've got plans in place to rectify that. That's, that's where we're at at the moment. Great. Thank you. Anything to add there, John? Or? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's kind of been uh, alluded to in some of the questions and, um, and some of the things that Will's just said. So, I, I mean, in my uh, career, the, 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 the slightly frustrating thing has always been that you can um, make, in discussion with patients, you can make changes to treatment, which um, is more cost effective. So the, the holy grail in all this is to have better treatment that actually saves the NHS money. And um, partly because we've been uh, part of the, the national contracting process. So the, the national contracting process has uh, driven down the cost, the overall cost of the of haemophilia care in terms of the, the drug spend over the years. So, um, and that's part of the reason why winning the argument in terms of access to new treatments like emesuzumab and hopefully gene therapy has been, you know, relatively straightforward. You know, um, I mean, we, we were one of, the, one of the first countries in the world to get, um, you know, kind of approval to use emesuzumab, you know, for non-inhibitor patients. And, and that, that's because of all the, you know, kind of the backdrop. And, but one thing that has been frustrating over the years is that you can, you know, as a team working in the Haemophilia Centre and a bunch of patients you're working with, you can do loads to uh, save money in terms of the way you're using uh, products um, and still deliver very high quality care. But it, it takes a lot of effort and it's, it, you need staff and you need resources and you need facilities to be able to do that. And um, there hasn't been a direct link, and there still isn't a direct link between saving money and then that money being ring fenced in some way to invest in the staffing and facilities infrastructure of the service. So Will and I have been kind of banging on about that over the last couple of years. And we, we haven't kind of won the argument, but we, we've, through the peer review and then other things the CRG has done, We'd, we've kind of created an opportunity. So, what, it, but it's all about the local delivery of that. So, a haemophilia centre, you know, anywhere in the UK, comprehensive care centre or haemophilia centre, their trust should get into a dialogue with their commissioners about the gaps in their service, which have been highlighted by the peer review, and say, right, we need a physio, we need a social worker, we need some space, whatever we need. Oh, and by the way, under the new framework for bleeding disorders, we can, uh, the NHS and you, the local commissioners, in terms of your specialised services budget, you're saving a whole load of money. So can we have some of that? And then in the next round of, um, um, of um, contracting and all the rest of it, we'll be in a position to really capitalise on making the whole situation not only high quality but also very cost effective so i think that that's that's the approach we're promoting and um you know the peer review um the way the peer review is discussed locally and you know getting patients involved with that is very very important uh, and can add a lot of weight to the um to the discussion locally so you know i'd encourage um everyone to do that you know in conjunction with their local service great thank you well i see that we've uh, we've overrun our time slightly it's now um 
five past seven, but that was really interesting. And thank you guys so much for answering all those questions at the end. I'm sure if anybody's got any other questions that they want to ask, you can always send them to me, email me, and I can always ask ask John and, and Will offline. I'm sure they, they're always very amenable to answering questions. Oh, we've got some good thumbs up there. Um, so just before I sign off tonight, I'll give a bit more promotion. We have another one of these uh, Bleeding Matters Live next week, which is our back to school. Uh, back to school Bleeding Matters Live. We've got a new schools booklet out that uh, Nicola has been busy writing. Um, we've got a paediatric nurse and one of our youth ambassadors is already a teacher who will be giving advice for those who are preparing their children to go back to school. So that's for next week. We're then taking um, a little bit of a break towards the end of August. Um, but we will be back with a series of more Bleeding Matters Live in September where we will be going through the guidelines that were referenced earlier. And we've also got one lined up on um, adapting to virtual consultations, which will be quite interesting. So those two are lined up and we may also have one um, looking at um, exercise, which we're in scoping at the moment. So lots to come up. Do have a look on our events calendar. You can find them all on our website and we will post them on social media. So um, that's all to thank both um, Will Horsley and John Hanley for joining us tonight. And thank you for giving your time. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll obviously make this available on the website. So thank you to everybody and hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.